Hello and welcome to this teaching from Pennington AG Church Online. Today we are into our third week of a series we are calling Faithfulness in a Time of Chaos as we are looking at the first six chapters of the Old Testament book of Daniel. And as we look at it, we're seeing the practices and the formational habits Daniel lived his life in in order to be a faithful person living through chaos. If you think wherever you are right now, you're living in a time of chaos, whether you're young and in college and trying to figure this all out, or whether you're older in life and you're seeing the world whip past you, When we look at the story of Daniel, we are reminded that even in the midst of a chaotic world or a chaotic life or chaotic circumstances, a faithful follower of God has peace and wisdom in the midst of it because our value and meaning in life doesn't come from our circumstances or culture. Today, we are looking at Um, specifically one practice or one discipline that Daniel practiced, and we'll be talking about seeking change through prayer, seeking to change this world through prayer, and seeking to change ourselves in times of prayer, meditation, and reflection. So we'll be looking at Daniel chapter 2, and as we look at Daniel and his prayer life, first let's get some context as we see it in the story of Daniel chapter 2. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. One night, During the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had such disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. He called in his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and he demanded that they tell him what he had dreamed. As they stood before the king, he said, I have had a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. Nebuchadnezzar is king of Babylon, and at this point he's probably in his 30s, and he had been king since he was a young man, and he really is at the height of his power in the story here of Daniel chapter 2. He has conquered the main enemy of the Babylonians, the Assyrians. He conquered them in his 20s, 10 years earlier. He had triumphed over them. They basically rule the whole area of Mesopotamia at this point. He has wealth power, influence, prestige, and he can do pretty much whatever he wants. Every earthly thing we could want, he has. One fact about Nebuchadnezzar as well is he's also very religious. We actually have ancient examples of prayers he had offered to his Babylonian gods when he was uh, coronated as king or in his own prayer life. He believed in the spiritual world. And so for Nebuchadnezzar, in the beginning of this chapter, to have a dream that terrifies into his spirit and into his soul, what it says is he may not even remember the dream. It's not that he's playing a game with his sorcerers or astrologers. He just doesn't remember. But he remembers waking up absolutely terrified into the core of his being that something spiritual is happening. Something in his soul is wrong. And so he brings them all together and he asks their advice and asks their wisdom because he's disturbed about his destiny or about his essence or his being. And let's acknowledge in this passage that a king who has power and influence and wealth still cannot control the quietness of his soul as he sleeps and as he dreams. We can have the trappings of every safety in this world. We can amass all the wins and securities, the home, the picket fence, the children, the job, the looks, the Instagram followers. We can bring it all together. But when we're honest with ourselves in the moments of quiet, and for many of us, that moment may only be when we lay our heads down on the pillow now. In those moments, there are still fears and unsettling realities in the depths of our soul. Who am I? Do I have value? What will happen to me in this next life? Where am I going and do people care? These are the questions we can't avoid in the depths of our soul. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar is walking through in this moment. And I want to share a quote from Jim Carrey. Yes, that Jim Carrey says this about life and eternity and about what gives us value in this world. Jim Carrey, if you don't know, big comedian, celebrity actor in America, he says, I wish everyone could get rich and famous and have everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see that's not the answer. This is at the heart of this study in Daniel, this study through Daniel's exile in Babylon and his walking through with Nebuchadnezzar. Is this question of what gives our lives value and security? Is it 
our location? Is it our possessions? Is it our ethnic identity and the groups we're in? Or does it come from something deeper, something richer, something more eternal? Because we see Daniel all throughout the story, all throughout these chapters, goes through tumultuous circumstances, ups, downs, new nations, new identities, new names, and there's always peace in his heart and in his soul. He rests in the security of the God he serves, the God who will provide for him, and the God he knows has brought a destiny into his life. Our God, our identity, our value, and our destiny are already assured for those of us that rest in the presence of God, for those of us today that know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Nothing can change that in this physical world. Daniel chapter 2, verse 11. We're going to jump ahead in this story. And so Nebuchadnezzar gives the, the idea that he had this dream, but he can't provide the details or won't provide the details. And so one of his advisors tells him this about trying to interpret this dream. He says to Nebuchadnezzar, No one except the gods can tell you your dream, and they do not live here among people. I love this phrase in Daniel because it reveals all of what we've studied in the rest of the Bible. We've already gone through in here, Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus. We've read through Kings, Chronicles, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and the story of God's kingdom. And one of the things we know about Yahweh throughout the Bible, one of the things we know about the Lord, the God of the Israelites, who comes in flesh in Jesus Christ, who lives as a spirit today in those who follow him and trust in his presence. One of the things we know about this God is... He lives among his people. He's here with us, in us, moving through us as a community. And so in Daniel 2 verse 11, when his advisors say, only the gods can interpret your dream, Nebuchadnezzar, but gods don't live among the people. We read this and we should think, oh, but there is one God who does live among his people. Exodus 29 verse 45 tells us this, of our God, of Yahweh, the God of Daniel. Then I will live among the people of Israel, and I will be their God. Yahweh says, I will live among them, I will live with them, and I will be their God. This sets the stage for what Daniel is about to do, or what God is going to do through Daniel in this story. Is a God that lives among his people, is still with his people, even in a chaotic land, and he empowers them to be faithful through this. So let's look at Daniel chapter 2, verses 13 through 19. We're going to see how Daniel now confronts this dream, confronts this problem, and this chaos. And because of the king's decree, men were sent to find and kill Daniel and his friends. This part already is incredible because they weren't involved in this. They weren't a part of this. They were just living their quiet life in their home. And an advisor knocks on the door and goes, hey, uh, the rest of the king's advisors couldn't interpret a dream that he couldn't even tell them what dream he had. And so you guys are going to have to die. And so you see how Daniel reacts to this and some of his wisdom. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, came to kill them, Daniel handled the situation with wisdom and discretion. He asked Arioch, why has the king issued such a harsh decree? So Arioch told him all that had happened. Daniel went at once to see the king and requested more time to tell the king what the dream meant. This is where we also see about Daniel's character. He's tough, not afraid of a fight. He's confident, but he's peaceful. Then Daniel went home after meeting with the king, and he told his friends Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah what had happened. He urged them to ask the God of heaven to show them his mercy by telling them the secret so they would not be executed along with the other wise men of Babylon. That night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. When we talk about faithfulness, we talk about Daniel being formed into a person who's faithful, that from an early age in Israel, he grew up under a revival under a king named Josiah. And in that revival, the disciplines of knowing God and being reminded of his character became important again. And so Daniel grew up with the reading of scripture as important, the memorization of God's word, with times of prayer and seeking God as important, with purity and passion in worship as important aspects of who he was. And one of the core disciplines we see over and over again in Daniel is this pattern of seeking God in prayer. And we see it here in this moment. He takes the problem. He goes, all right, let's pray on this tonight. He brings his friends together and he says, let's seek God together. 
And so in this, I'm going to talk about just two things that prayer does, two ways it changes. Number one, prayer changes us, changes who we are. Number two, prayer changes our circumstances. It affects the world around us. And in this story, we'll see both at play. To pray is to change. And the first is to change ourselves. There are experiences and people in life that change us. Study or practice of an instrument or study in college changes us over time. As we spend hours reading and studying and searching on this, it changes who we are. Or there are moments that change us in an instant. Meeting your first child, falling head over heels in love. These moments change us in the very core of who we are and who we understand ourselves to be. When it comes to prayer, it's this understanding that as we spend time in God's presence, as we get to know him as a living being with a will and a desire and a personality, our time in his presence changes us. It changes who we are, sometimes gradually, sometimes in a moment, in an instant, we are changed by his presence. In prayer, God transforms us by the proximity of his presence. The closer we are to God, the more we press in, the more we make space and invite him into our lives, the more he changes us and shapes us to be like him. Daniel goes into prayer, seeking salvation, seeking God to rescue them, seeking mercy by helping them out in this moment. And what he receives is salvation through transformation. God changes Daniel. And we see here that God has been changing Daniel every moment he spends with him. Every moment he spends in God's presence, he's being shaped and changed. Daniel, in this book, already is known as somebody who interprets dreams, already is somebody who has the gift of dream interpretation. And as we see later on, Daniel says in Daniel 2, 27 and 28, that dream interpretation is not a characteristic of Daniel. It's a characteristic of God which God shares with him. Daniel says, There are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. Daniel says in Babylon, I do not interpret dreams, but I know a God I serve who interprets dreams and reveals secrets. And as I spend time in his presence, he makes me like him. He reveals his character into me. And as I spend time in his presence, he shapes me and shares with me the gift of dream interpretation. Anything Daniel says he can do is because his God has done it and has shared the grace of his presence with him. And this makes our lives simple. It makes our faith journey simple. It makes prayer simple. Our task in life is to soak up the presence of God is to soak in the love of his presence. Doing this changes us. Soaking in the love of God roots out our selfishness. It makes us sensitive to the needs of others. And it slows us down to hear the rhythms of creation and resurrection. The more time we spend in God's presence, the more we are shaped into his likeness. At this stage of my life, my prayer life is 80-20. 80% of my prayer life is spent listening and 20% is spent talking. I spend more time just sitting in silence or walking in silence or sitting reading my scriptures and inviting the presence of God to speak to me from the pages, to speak to me in moments of silence. I'll lay out to God a circumstance or how I'm feeling and I'll just wait. I'll wait for him to speak or I'll wait for him to shape me or I'll wait for him to give me a glimpse of what he is going to do Or I'll wait for him to heal something in me by his love and his presence. I learn to love through the gracious love that God gives to me as a sinner. As he spends time with me, I know I don't deserve it and he lovingly gives it to me. And I walk out of there knowing to give grace and mercy to others. I'm challenged to confess my sins when I'm exposed to the righteousness of my creator. His perfection reveals my sin and drives me to be better, to repent, to confess, to seek his grace. And in silence, he reveals my sin and he embraces me with his love. 
James chapter 4, verse 3 says it like this. Author James, uh, brother of Jesus, early church leader, he writes on prayer and God's relationship by saying it like this. He says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. To spend time in God in prayer is not just reading him a laundry list of the things we want or the dreams of our heart of how great we want and to be respected and known by others, but is to sit in his presence and allow him to shape us so that our passions are his. Real prayer, silence and solitude in God's presence is learning, is learning to desire what God desires, to love what God loves, to will what God wills in this world. The standard of Daniel, as we see here in Daniel 2, 17 and 18, we see it again in Daniel 6, verse 10. We see it again later on in Daniel 9. The standard is to spend regular periods of time in God's presence, inviting him to change, shape, and mold him. We see this in the New Testament as well. Jesus gives us this example. More often than not, When we see Jesus in prayer, it's Jesus early or late, a time getting away in silence, sitting in God's presence. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, And in the morning, a great while before day, he rose and went out to a lonely place, and there he prayed. This is as Mark wrote about Jesus, that more often than not, Jesus would get up and avoid the crowd, avoid his disciples, and spend time in silence, inviting the presence of his Father to speak to him to change him, to grow him. Matthew 6, verse 6, Jesus teaches us to pray like this. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. A faithful follower of God spends time listening to his voice to be shaped by his presence. And oftentimes people say this and then they give us these like mammoth examples of what that looks like. People will say Martin Luther during the Reformation spent three hours a day in prayer seeking God. And he said, I couldn't do anything in my day without three hours of prayer. People will tell you John Wesley would get up at 4 a.m. and he would pray until the sun rose every day. They would tell you Jonathan Edwards would pace in his office for hours praying over and over again for God's presence. And we hear these examples examples and they're 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 impressive but they can also be discouraging i can't the three hours three hours in prayer 4 a.m 4 a.m okay i we hear these and sometimes they can kind of beat us down and they make prayer almost into this this marathon chore that we feel like it's just not possible but i want to teach you how to run a marathon you just put your shoes on You get out there and you start moving. You start maybe running around the block. You start doing one mile or maybe two and then into three. You run once a week and then three times a week and you get your patterns up. Spending time in God's presence is the same way. Just put your shoes on. Just get moving. Set aside five minutes. Turn your radio off on a car ride to work or back. Don't put your headphones in as you're going for a walk or at the gym. Take a moment in silence where you normally would be in noise. And invite God's voice to speak to you. Lay out a desire of your heart and invite him to shape you and work on you. And how does this then create in Daniel a pattern of faithfulness? And I'm going to do a little bit of exegetical work. We're going to do a little bit of Bible work right here. So we're going to look at Exodus chapter 3 verses 14 and 15. We're going to look back. God replied to Moses. Moses asked him, who, who do I say is sending me to the Israelite people? Who, who's sending me? God says, I am who I am. We get the word Yahweh from this. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. Yahweh, or I am, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Yahweh, which means I am, means I am consistently faithful to who I have always been. And God says, when you spend time in me, you will know that I am the faithful God. And as you spend time in my faithfulness, I will shape you to be faithful yourself. 
And if you're wondering, how do I be faithful in a chaotic world, at a chaotic pace, in a chaotic reality? Turn into God's presence, who is our example of faithfulness, who was and is and always will be the same character and goodness of who he is, who fulfills his promises from generation to generation. And as we spend time in his presence praying, he changes us to become faithful people. Soren Kierkegaard, one of my favorite theologians, says this, A man prayed, and at first he thought that praying was talking. But he became more and more quiet until in the end he realized that prayer is listening. So the first thing in prayer is prayer changes us. Prayer changes who we are by being in God's presence. The second thing is prayer changes our circumstances. It does. It changes reality. I have prayed over people who have felt healings in their body. I've prayed over people and in the exact moment seen them transformed or set free or given hope or emotional healing. I've been prayed over me and felt God speak a word immediately in that moment or transform a circumstance I've been walking through. What a changing circumstance prayer says about our God is that Our God and the universe he has created are not closed to us. We don't live in a closed system, in a closed loop that always will be. We live in a world that is open to change, hopeful, able to grow and be better and be more full of life and more organized and healthy and full of joy. We live in a world that can change for the better. And we seek God for that change in goodness. Richard Foster says it like this. Richard Foster is a uh, theologian alive today, one of the best writers about discipline and formation that I've ever read. His book, Celebration of Discipline, is a modern classic. If you're watching this right now and you've never read that, just turn this off. Turn this off. Go read Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. In that book, he says this about prayer. He says, we are working with God to determine the future. Certain things will happen in history if we pray rightly. We are to change the world by prayer. That sounds heavy, right? Can we? What does that look like? Is that even possible? How do our cries, our intercession change a perfect loving God? Well, we have examples in scripture. In Exodus 32, 14, Moses prays and intercedes with God for his people and God changes the circumstance of what he's going to do. In Jonah, chapter 3, verse 10, Jonah doesn't even want to pray this prayer, but he prays a prayer for the city of Nineveh, the Assyrians, and God changes the circumstance of the punishment he was going to give. When we intercede for others, it can change the circumstances of our world. This is what happens in Daniel chapter 2. Verses 17 and 19, Daniel intercedes for the intellectuals and for the astrologers and the magicians and for the other exiles in Babylon, and this is what happens. Daniel chapter 2, verses 17 through 19. Then Daniel went home and he told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, what had happened. He urged them to ask the God of heaven to show his mercy by telling them the secret so they would not be executed along with the other wise men. That night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. They sought God to change the circumstance and God changed the circumstance through changing Daniel by giving him the interpretation of this dream. He changes what's going to happen. All these people are going to be killed, including their own lives. God intercedes based on their prayer and saves them. Daniel receives a knock on the door. You're going to die. Daniel goes, whoa, 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 whoa. Can I try something first? Can I talk to my God first? Can I intercede a little bit before you just kill us for something we literally have not been involved in? And then he gathers his friends together for an all-night prayer vigil, for all-night prayer interceding. And this is a pattern we see from Abraham arguing with God on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah, all the way through to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, to the early church in Acts praying over Peter who's in prison. We pray and we intercede for God to change circumstances. Prayer doesn't just change me. It changes our circumstances. And I believe this, that when we seek God, it is the power to change the reality around us. I do a book study with a few other pastors and theologians and friends, um, and we read different books that challenge us that are related to our ministries. Uh, And one of them, we read a um, scholarly dissertation about the prosperity movement um, called Blessed, about people who really believe that God intercedes, gives wealth and health and victory and power and all of these things. 
And while I have a lot of problems with some of the theology in there, and we talked about this at length, what I felt like God revealed to me as I read about these, you know, flawed men and women trying their best to do ministry, part of it I understood was they want their faith to do something. They want their faith to mean something in this world. They want their faith to be more than just theoretical and more than just psychosomatic of changing my mind and my heart. I want my faith to be able to affect this world. I want to be able to pray for loved ones and people I care about and know that God is doing something and working something. I want to be able to pray for the brokenness of this world and trust that God can and will heal it and intercede for it. I want to pray for the oppressed and those fighting through injustice and believe that God can change circumstances in this world to make it more like his kingdom. I believe that God can and will work in this world. And as we see Daniel intercede in the Babylonian empire, we see him in prayer seek circumstances to change and for God to move and work on his behalf. John 15 verse 7, Jesus gives us this encouragement. He says, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask me for anything you want and it will be granted. But here is the kicker. God doesn't exist to give you anything you want. God doesn't exist to give you that car you've been praying about or that house you've been praying about or that girl you've been praying about. God, just make her notice me when I go to the locker. God doesn't exist to do these frivolous things in our physical life. He may and he could in those moments. But our prayer life is about primarily spending time in God's presence to learn what he cares about, to learn what breaks the heart of God, to learn what he loves and what he wills in this world. And as our will becomes aligned with his will, our prayers become sharper and more powerful and more in line with the kingdom of God. And now what breaks my heart is what breaks God's heart. And I'm seeking God to intercede for these people and for these circumstances and for this brokenness that it be healed. And me and God are on the same page and God's moving and working as I'm praying and crying out my heart. We first seek to align our heart with God and then he transforms our prayer life to change the circumstances of our world. Know that your prayers can change the world. They can. God works in you and moves through you by the grace of Jesus Christ. Pray boldly. Daniel Daniel interferes for the lives of hundreds, including his own. Ask God to guide your prayers to the salvation of others. And lastly, I want to close just reflecting on Daniel's celebration in this moment, what Daniel prays and praises. Daniel chapter 2, verses 19 through 23, as God reveals the change of these circumstances, as he reveals the dream interpretation to Daniel, this is how Daniel responds. And this prayer can be considered a summary of all of the book of Daniel. That night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. He said, Praise the name of God forever and ever, for he has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. He reveals deep and mysterious things and knows what lies hidden in darkness, though he is surrounded by light. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors, for you have given me wisdom and strength. You have told me what we asked of you and revealed to us what the king demanded. Attuning ourselves to divine breathing and divine presence is spiritual work. But without it, our prayer is vain repetition. Listening to God is the first step. And receiving his wisdom and grace is the product. Jesus, on his time on earth, As he teaches us about prayer, he teaches us to come to God like little children. He says he is your father and he wants to give you good gifts and he wants to spend time in your presence. He wants to know your heart and he wants to share with you his. And Jesus teaches us to come boldly to the throne of God and to speak with God and to sit at his feet and to hear his wisdom. The reason God answers prayer is because we are his children. And he's a loving father who wants to give good gifts. Daniel is like us, a person with nothing to fear because he knows the character of God. And even in circumstances that deserve fear 
or deserve anxiety. You're going to die because of nothing you have done in a foreign kingdom, away from your family and the land that you've known. Daniel doesn't fear because he knows he can come before his God and his God has all wisdom and strength. Many of us today are struggling. You may be in fear or you may be looking forward to to a new hope. And I want you to know that God is inviting you into his presence. That because of Jesus Christ, because of his life, his death on the cross, and his resurrection, we can come boldly into God's presence with his spirit in us. God places his presence in us to work through us. And he invites us to pray before him to change and transform this world. In the first century, Paul would look back on the life of Jesus and refer to him as the power of God and the wisdom of God. He's referring back to Daniel's praise here that Jesus was and is the power and wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1.24 Jesus is where God's wisdom comes uniquely, perfectly, and fully made and fully known. Jesus is the wise and righteous one who mediates relationship between this world and our Father in heaven. God revealed himself in a vision to Nebuchadnezzar and he reveals himself in wisdom to Daniel and he reveals himself to us today through Jesus Christ, our Savior, our friend, and our King. Boldly come before God's presence and he will change you as we spend time with him and through our prayers, he will change the circumstances of this world. I invite you to pray with me. And if you're watching this today, and you don't have a relationship with God or you're afraid or feeling like you're living in this chaos and you want a relationship with Jesus, I would love to pray you into that first step of accepting him and calling on the name of Jesus and know that when we do this, Jesus immediately sends his spirit into our lives to seal us for eternity, to empower us, give us vision and direction and that we would no longer fear death because Christ has conquered it. Pray this with me. Today, God, we come before you and we come into your presence as we learn the power of prayer to change us and to change the circumstances of the world. We know the greatest, most powerful prayer we can pray is a prayer of inviting you, Jesus, to be our Savior and our King. Today, Jesus, I pray that you would be my Savior. I believe that you lived in this earth as God and man in one flesh. I believe you died for my sin, were buried in the grave, and rose again so that we all could be made alive again in you. You gave your life for me. Today I give my life to you. Will you lead me, follow me, and be my King and Savior forever? I will follow you all my days. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this teaching from Pennington AG Church Online. I invite you back here to join us every week as we finish out this series of faithfulness in a time of chaos, looking at the example of Daniel as he trusts in the character of his God. Thank you.